these figures would come at night, they would stand at my door and watch me and I would have this fear in my heart. And this fear would overtake me. I thought it was a dream. A lot of times I felt like I was just falling. Wake up and there's a figure. And I would scream, my mom thought I was crazy. She thought I had a mental illness. And it went from standing at my door to hovering over me and choking me out. The morning after I did cocaine, every single morning I would feel dead. Like I wanted to die. I didn't want to be alive. I hated my life. I didn't understand the meaning of life. And you know, I would always say this. I guess you could say as a prayer. I would say, if there is a God out there, set me free from this stuff because I don't want it. Next thing you know, my brother said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out. And I threw up a ball of blood. And after I threw up that ball of blood, I felt like something was removed from my eyes. And I started even seeing the colors and like the colors around me was different. The smell was different. Everything was just different. And I was like, he's real. Well, Alex, it's an honor to have you on the channel today. For people who may be watching, who may have never seen you, don't know you, could you just introduce yourself very briefly to them? Uh, my name is Alex Rivera. My parents are Puerto Rican. I was born in New York, raised in Broward County. Um, I'm a father of four girls. I have a wife and I'm a born again Christian. Come on, man. Man, like I said, it's an honor, Alex, to have you on today. Um, tell us about your life before Jesus, starting with your childhood. Um, so I was born into Catholicism. My parents raised me as a Catholic up until 10 years old. Uh, as a Catholic, I was an altar server. I served in the church. I did communion. I did confirmation. And uh, being in the church, I saw things that kind of turned me off of who God was. It kind of gave me a bitter taste in my mouth. So I told my mom that I never want to go back to church. Um, she didn't understand why. What were some of those things that, that you saw, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I saw a lot of hypocrisy. Um, one day I fell into sin as a child and I stole a piece of candy and my mom told me that I had to go to the confession booth and confess my sins to the priest. And as I did so, I felt very uncomfortable. I didn't even understand why I had to speak to him. Uh, he told me to say 10 Hail Marys and an Our Father and I'd be forgiven. So I kind of contradicted that in a way, like, why do I need to do that? And um, also I saw a lot of weird things as the the man that ran the altar altar group was touching girls and i would see that as a child and i didn't understand at the time but as i grew up it was just like how can god allow that mm -hmm. so that just you know made me turn away from the lord growing up i was exposed to a lot of sexual things my parents would be watching you know movies on tv that i wouldn't allow my children to see at that age and it opened me up to perversion um my mom used to babysit kids and at the age of eight years old i would do things with boys and girls mm. as far as sexual things you know i want to be transparent dry humping um even trying to have sex with them and um you know at the time i didn't understand it and i couldn't control myself I ended up opening the door to pornography, became addicted to pornography. Um, at the age of 11, I was already masturbating, doing things that I wasn't supposed to do at an, at an age of 11. I ended up getting caught by my mother. She didn't understand it either. She said, how did you learn these things? As a child, I didn't know. Growing up, I started seeing things. At the age of 11, after I opened the door to pornography, I started seeing shadows in my room. Um, these figures would come at night, they would stand at my door and watch me and I would have this fear in my heart. And this fear would overtake me. I thought it was a dream. A lot of times I felt like I was just falling. Wake up and there's a figure. And I would scream, my mom thought I was crazy. She thought I had a mental illness. And it went from standing at my door to hovering over me and choking me out. Mm. I ended up seeing a psychiatrist. I ended up seeing a doctor. They said that I'm having sleep paralysis, but I didn't believe that. So I ended up just dealing with it. Every time I would say in our father, because the only prayer that I really believed for some reason as a child that gave me peace was the our father. Mm. So every time I saw the spirit, whatever it was at the time, at the time I didn't know, I would say the our father and it would go. It would just leave. And, you know, throughout the years, I grew accustomed to seeing this. It would just show up and I'd be like, oh, it's you. I'm going to sleep. And I didn't understand it. It led me to do drugs because that was the only way I could peacefully go to sleep. I started smoking marijuana at the age of 15. 
kind of got peer pressured into it. You know, my, my cousin told me, hey, bro, you know, smoke this. It's going to give you peace. It's going to heal you from all the pain that you're going through. Because at the time, my, gran my grandmother ended up passing away. When she passed away, that was a big part of me. You know, she was, she was like my mom and dad. She loved me unconditionally. And um, basically, I fell into the trap of smoking weed, got addicted to the marijuana. Now I, I, I want to feed my addiction. So I started finding on ways how to feed my addiction because at the time I didn't have finances. So I started doing home invasions. I started stealing from drug dealers. At the time, we called it busting licks. So we would go meet up with the drug dealer, bust a lick on him, take his drugs, and then I would go and sell them, flip them, and feed my addiction that way. How old were you at this time? At that time, I was 17 years old. Wow. And me and my friends would just, that's all we did is smoke weed. Smoke weed day and night. And it actually helped me out. But see, the thing is, there came a point where I smoked so much weed that it was doing nothing for me. I was still waking up depressed. I was still waking up suicidal. I was still waking up feeling empty, feeling like I needed to feed more of my addiction. Mm. And one day I met this girl at my job. She kind of changed my life in a way because I ended up impregnating her with my firstborn. When my daughter was born, she said, you need to get your life together. The drugs, the selling, you're not gonna have that around my child. So I said, all right. So I stopped. I started trying to get my act together, but you know, obviously without Christ, we can't do nothing. At the time, I got a job and ended up quitting the job. And I started partying like crazy because I was trying to run from the responsibility of being a father. Mm -hmm. I was trying to create a fantasy world where I was just going to the club. I'm not having a daughter. It's all good. And I ended up le let it, leaving her alone for most of her pregnancy. She was sleeping on the bed by herself while I was out in the club cheating with other women. And she got tired of it. So when my daughter was born, my daughter grew up with a separated mother and father. Mm. And I ended up going into the Molly. I got addicted to Molly, started getting deep into the club scene. And, and the only time I would be happy is when I took Molly. Until one day I went to a club space in Miami and I bought a Molly that was in Molly. I basically overdosed. It was the, when I went to the hospital, they told me that I had overdosed on speed. Mm. And um, basically, I was begging my friends that were in the car because I felt my body shutting down. My skin turned um, silky blue. And my friend was like, bro, what's going on with you? Your skin is turning blue. And I, and I looked at myself and I was like, I can't breathe. I forgot how to breathe. I can't breathe. And my friends were tripping out on LSD. They were afraid. They were paranoid that if they took me to the hospital, they're going to get arrested. And um, long story short, they didn't take me to the hospital. I ended up going to the hospital when they took me home. And by that time, I was already throwing up um, stomach acid and blood. Wow. And my, my dad took me to the hospital. They told me that I was having a reaction to a drug. So I woke up to my daughter at the end of the bed, and I was scared because I didn't want her to see me like this. Mm. And at that moment in time, I said, I'm never touching that again. And I didn't. But the ignorance is that I went from Molly to cocaine. So it's like every part of my life, I went from one addiction to another. I have a very addictive personality. I started taking cocaine and I started becoming an alcoholic. I had to drink every single day. That's the way I numb myself. And every time I drank, I had to take at least a 20 sack to the face. And I would meet up with my friend every single day because me and my wife, my girlfriend at the time, we would argue, and the way I would escape from these arguments is by meeting up with my friend, taking a bag to the face, getting drunk, going home, and I'm numb. But the bad thing about that was that every single morning that I did, uh, the morning after I did cocaine, every single morning I would feel dead. Like I wanted to die. I didn't want to be alive. I hated my life. I didn't understand the meaning of life. And, you know, I would always say this, I guess you could say it's a prayer. I would say, if there is a God out there, set me free from this stuff because I don't want it. I ended up meeting this guy. He was 21 years old and he came to my job. I was his trainer. I trained him and he ended up being my um, helper. So now I have a guy that works with me every day and I usually like to go to the bar every Friday. And one day I said, hey, bro, let's go to the bar. You party? And he was like, I used to. I actually left my father's house 
because I was dealing with addictions and I, I, I'm in recovery. So I said, recovery? Man, bro, you only live once. Let's get it. Let's go party, bro. You're young. At your age, I was getting, I was getting lit. How old were you at that time? At that time, I was 31. I ended up peer pressuring him into partying with me and it became an every week thing for about six months. His name was Ryan. And, um, you know, one day he, uh, he didn't want to party. And I told him, oh, let's, let's just, let's just do it, bro. And I don't have no money. I said, bro, it's all right. I'll get it for you. He ended up getting off the phone call. So I text him, I got the stuff. Let's just party. Get me next week. So he calls me. He says, fine, pick me up. I actually couldn't find the stuff. So I ended up buying from a random man at the bar. He sold us a bag. We finished the bag. I take him home. I got home and I started feeling weird. My heart started palpitating. I felt shortness of breath. My mind and, and, and um, my heart was racing. And I didn't understand why. And I went downstairs trying to hide it from my wife because my wife didn't know I was addicted to anything except alcohol. She knew that I was an alcoholic because she's seen me every day. I had to have an, an alcoholic beverage. I go to work on Monday and my helper's not there. And I'm like, that's weird. He always comes to work. So halfway through the day, about 1230, I get a call from my manager and says, Alex, I need you to come to the office. We need to speak to you. And I said, is everything okay? She said, I don't want to tell you over the phone because you're behind the wheel. So I'd rather just wait to tell you till you get to the office. Mm -hmm. Mind you, this guy was very close to me. I grew up, even though, you know, I, I, it was about drugs. I actually felt close to him because he understood me. He related to me. We were open to each other about things, even from our childhood. And so when we got to, when I got to the office, they told me he, that he died that they found him overdosed on the uh, couch with a beer on his hand watching TV. He died instantly. And I was like, what? He can't be dead? What do you mean he's dead? He overdosed on something. And the cops want to question you because you were the last one with him. Mm. I kind of got a fear in me because nobody knows I do anything when it comes to narcotics. Cop comes to my house, he asks me questions and he says, Alex, what happened? So I have to be truthful at that moment in time because I want to know what happened. So I told him, you know, I picked him up and we, we, we partied. We did cocaine together and I did feel, feel weird that night, but I didn't think anything of it. And he said, okay, well, we're going to investigate this. We're not trying to make you a suspect or anything, but we just want to get to know what's actually happened, you know, to him and who was with him at the time. And I said, oh, that's fine. So two weeks later, he comes back and he says, so we ran some tests and we found out that he had overdose on fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And there was enough fentanyl on whatever he did to kill a horse. So my question to you, Alex, is how are you alive? And I said, I don't know, but I did it with him. It doesn't make sense if you did it. I think, we, I think you sold it to him. Wow. And I said, what? No, I didn't sell anything to him. I did it with him. So basically, they were trying to pin his death on me, which in a way, it was my fault because I had peer pressured him, a man that was recovering from addiction back into addiction. And don't get me wrong, that was tearing me up inside. Basically, you know, I told the cop, it wasn't me. You can check the cameras at the bar. You see me walking in and out of the bathroom. We were taking turns and he said, that's fine. We're going to continue to investigate, but we just want you to know it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up that you were doing a bag with him that killed him, but you're alive. Explain that scientifically. It makes no sense. And I said, I don't know what to tell you. They, I guess, dropped the charges or whatever they had against me or whatever assumptions because he never really came back. But you would think that I would stop. No, I went harder. I started doing eight balls and the eight balls weren't satisfying me. So I started taking Xanax on top of that. Now I'm mixing uppers with downers and I want to die because I have the guilt of this man's death in my heart. I can't forgive me. I have to deal with this, his family's pain. And it's crazy because the mother, I feel that the reason I came to Christ was because she prayed. Wow. She didn't condemn me. She didn't pray, uh, blame me for his death. But what she said is, Alex, I forgive you. And I pray that there's healing in your life. I pray that you forgive yourself. It's, it hurts, but I don't blame you. 
The Father, you know, I pray that He received the healing and I pray that He encounters Christ because I know that what I did was wrong, but I want to let them know that I thank God for the prayers and I thank God for everything that, that has happened because it made me who I am. And, you know, sh long story short, through the cocaine, I started taking um, Xanax. I started smoking weed again. And one day I was in the Keys with my wife and my two friends. It was my birthday. And I started seeing a kid from my childhood, one of the guys that I used to rob drug dealers with. I seen his life changing. And I was watching. I was, pay play I was paying close attention. I was like, hmm, he's following Jesus. Who's the Catholic Jesus that I know doesn't really change anybody. So I started watching him and I started seeing him around a brother that I knew, Rich 99, that he was always in music videos and stuff. And I'm like, wow, Christian hip hop is cool. It actually looks cooler than the hip hop that I listen to because it's speaking life. So one day I'm in the Keys and I see this brother, he comes all the way to the Keys and I'm thinking we're gonna party because like I said, I don't believe Jesus. At that time, I didn't believe Jesus could change lives. So when he came, He's like, yeah, what's up, man? How you been? And I'm like, oh, I'm all right, I guess. He's like, well, okay. You know, he came and shared the gospel with me. I was questioning it because I was like, what do you mean he changed your life? Like, let's go get high. Let's go, let's go drink. He's like, no, I don't do that no more. And I was like, once he said, I don't do that no more, that's where it touched my heart because I was like, deep down inside, I wanted to stop all that nonsense. I wanted to stop smoking. I wanted to stop sniffing. I wanted to stop drinking because even though it numbed me and it brought pleasure at the moment, I was still dying inside. Mm. So when he said, I don't do that no more. I said, how did you do that? He said, Jesus. And I said, Jesus. All right, so say if this Jesus can change me, how do I do so? He said, well, let's have a fellowship. Come to the fellowship. We'll pray for you. If after this prayer, you stay the same, live your life. Live your life the way you're living it. And at that time, I was already studying the devil because I was into conspiracy theories, the Illuminati, Freemasons, all this stuff. And I told myself, if I could believe in that, then I have to see and give a shot to this Jesus. So I did. And mind you, that week before the fellowship, the fellowship was on a Saturday. Monday, the fear came upon me. Uh, I, I started coming up with excuses on not to go. I was like, but I kept asking myself, why am I afraid? The whole week, I'm just like, what am I going to do? Why am I, what's going to happen? And this and that. I just got all these questions running through my head. And um, Thursday, I went and bought a bag. And on the way to my friend's house, I was at a red light coming off of a highway. It's on the Sawgrass Expressway. When you get off of Southwest 10th, it turns from a highway into a main road. So a lot of people, when they get off that highway, they continue to speed, but you're really supposed to slow down because the speed limit goes to 45, but many just keep going 60. So I was at a red light and this 18 wheeler truck was going 60 and I was at a complete stop. And I just see a truck to my left hand. Mind you, the left hand lane is a median. It's like, grass. I see the truck hit the median, miss me by this much, and the guy go like this. He was about to rear end me, probably take my life. And I was like, what just happened? So right away, I called my friend. I was like, bro, I almost died. And he's like, what do you mean? Man, come over here and let's get high, bro. And I, so I go and I get there and it's still running through my head. I'm like, I almost died. And right away, I started to feel and, and witness that Jesus was real because I said, bro, I think the devil just tried to take my life because if he took my life right now, I'm going to hell. And he's like, what do you mean, bro? You're crazy. I was like, no, bro, I'm about to experience Jesus on Saturday. And the devil just tried to take my life today. This is crazy. This was not normal. And he goes, oh, bro, you're killing my high. Chill out. So I was like, maybe I'm overthinking. So I kept, you know, doing my thing. Friday comes me and my wife get into this argument because I told my wife, I want you to come with me. She's like, all right, we'll give it a try. And Friday, we got into this argument. She ended up not even sleeping on the same bed with me. She went to my kids' room and slept with them. And I'm very prideful at that time. You know, I'm the type of person that I won't speak to you if you don't speak to me first, and I won't apologize. But when I was laying on that bed alone, I heard a small, simple voice tell me, you better go apologize and tell her we need to go tomorrow. So I was like, whoa, babe, I'm sorry but we need to go tomorrow, forgive me for what I did. I never do that. And when she saw that, she said, 
okay, so we'll go. So we go. And I'm in that house and I'm feeling anxious. My heart is racing. And I'm like, oh, how long is this going to take? Like, this is taking beers on my mind, cocaine's on my mind. I'm like, this take, this taking too long. We're talking about Jesus and this and that. And finally, they go, all right, we're going to pray. And when they prayed for me, I witnessed that demons were real. But Jesus was so much realer because demons started to manifest. My whole left side went numb and paralyzed and I couldn't move it. And I couldn't understand why. And blasphemous things were coming out of my mouth. I was speaking in a different language. And I was afraid. I was like, what's going on here? Next thing you know, my brother said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out. And I threw up a ball of blood. And after I threw up that ball of blood, I felt like something was removed from my eyes. And I started even seeing the colors and pe like the colors around me was different. The smell was different. Everything was just different. And I was like, he's real. Wow. And my brother said that right away, I started even prophesying. And I didn't even know what prophecy was. He's like, bro, you're even prophesying. What do you? And I'm like, what do you mean? I don't even know what that means. But tell me how I could get closer to him. And so they started teaching me. They started getting me in the word. I even told them, bro, I, I want to fast. Tell me how I got to fast. He's like, well, you could do a water fast. I was like, I'm going to do a water fast for three months, but I'm going to only eat three days a week. I was fasting like, I think two days out of the week for three months. Wow. And I was, and, and, and don't get me wrong, man. I was like feeling him. I was soaking in his presence, but I was also growing. And I was just so overwhelmed by his presence that till this day, I'm just in awe because this entire walk and this entire life that I've lived, I didn't have him, but I only had him watching over me, but I didn't have him here. He protected me. He kept me from death. And I understand that today he only did that because he is the only one that can set me free. He was the only one that loved me more than anyone in this world could ever love me. And I'm at all to this day. How old were you when you, um, when that happened, when that encounter with God and 30, you were delivered? 31. Wow. I'm 34 today. Talk to us about uh, the, the three years, the last three years. As soon as I came to Christ, I was walking with my brothers and my brothers, they were, uh, they did a lot of evangelism and they did a lot of, uh, ministering in the streets, a lot of traveling. And right away, uh, a week after I got saved, I started ministering to all my friends. I was like, bro, you need to know Jesus. Do you see me? And they all thought that, you know, it was a phase. They all thought that it was all just a front, but I, I was proving to them, some of them by the fruit that Jesus really did change my life because of the way I was talking with them, the way I was acting around them. And one of my friends was like, all right, bro, I do see something different. So how can I get closer to him? So I brought my brothers with me and we went to his house. We were going to pray for his deliverance. And this is when I started to see God's hand and what his purpose was in my life. I didn't know anything about deliverance other than what they did with, you know, what the Lord did with, through them on me. And they were praying for him and nothing was happening. And then um, the brother said, Alex, lay your hand on him and tell it to come out. And I didn't know anything about deliverance. So at the time, the Lord knew my heart because he knew what I meant. But I was like, all negative energy, come out right now in Jesus' name. And the dude fell and got set free. And right then and there, our brothers was like, bro, you have a calling on your life. Let's get it. And ever since then, I just, I've been going to the trenches. I've been going to the hoods. I've been going to the areas that... You know, many people don't want to go to, to tell them, tell them about Jesus, to plant those seeds and to share the gospel with, with those that don't want to hear it because I was once there. You know what I mean? I was once the one that was running away from the truth, the one that didn't want to hear the truth. Yeah. You know, now he, he uses me in those areas where it's all glory to him, but he, I've been to California. I've been to Chicago. I've been to Atlanta. I've been to Tennessee. I'm actually on my way to uh, California in July. I'm going to meet up with uh, Kingdom Music yeah. for a revival. And that's what he's been doing. And I just look forward to see what he's going to continue to do because my life is no longer my own. Hmm. Now, Alex, you, you had a strong background in drugs. Yes. And you encountered the presence of God. Deliverance happened. After that moment, 
and even in these last three years of walking with Jesus, did the 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 wanting of drugs, that desire, that overwhelming desire, did it go away uh, in that moment, or did you did Jesus had to continue to work in that space after that deliverance? So the drugs went away radically. It from one day to another, the urge, the even the thought of it, just I, I have been sober for going on three years, wow. and. Um, I don't even think about it, but I do say that the one thing that I did continue struggling with that the Lord had to sanctify me with and continuously have to nug on me was pornography and lust. That's been one of the battles as a, as a man of God that, you know, seeing what we see in the world, half naked women, you know, women dressed immoral and no modesty in them. You see that continuously and it's like the biggest battle was doing, you know, looking down. So I thank God that, you know, today he has killed that side of me, but that has been the struggle. Wow. How's your relationship with your family today? Uh, I, I love them. You know, I love my mom and dad. They love the change. Um, I pray and pray that they would continue to see the truth in me so that they may follow the truth. You know, I have forgiven them and I pray that they have forgiven me. Alex, who is Jesus to you? Jesus is the love of my life. Jesus is the one that found me when I didn't want to be found, when I didn't even think I could be found. He went above and beyond continuously, over and over, tugging at my heart. And he did everything he could just to show me how real he is. And he set me free and he replaced a life of death with true life, which is him. And he gave me everything that I couldn't understand. I, I didn't understand why I couldn't have, which is a family. He gave me my wife and my four girls. To me, he's everything because it is all because of him that I have that. Did you get the chance to have a conversation with the mother of the friend that passed away in the drug overdose? Uh, did you ever get to have that moment with with her? Only that one time where she um, basically said, "I, you know, I forgive you and I, I pray that you're healed from this. I felt comforted in a time of, of destruction. Yeah. What are some words that you can offer to her and, and, and the family? I pray that you find it in your heart to forgive me because I know that what I did may have caused a lot of destruction in the family and a lot of pain and grief. But I want you to know that I loved and I still do love Ryan and I love you guys and Jesus loves you guys. And I thank God that he has found me in that dark place to show you guys that there is restoration and healing in him, and only he's the only, only he can do it. And I pray that you find it in your heart to find that healing and restoration through Christ. Alex, for for men and women who may be finding themselves in that same position that you once were, in the cycle of abusing drugs, and even it's you know hidden, where at some point your your wife didn't even know, people around you didn't know that you were going through this. For those people who are watching, who are struggling in that space, and maybe nobody knows. What, what it's a word of encouragement that you can offer to them? To follow what you feel. Because a lot of us that deal with addiction deep down don't want it. Deep down, we don't want to deal with that addiction. Deep down, we want to be free. But the thing is, we think that we can set ourselves free. We think that there's freedom in the drug. But the drug just continues to bind us up and put us in bondage and continue to leave us in a destructive lifestyle that continues to break us, it only leads to death. And Jesus is the only one that can set you free from it. And I promise you that because I never thought there was freedom, but he gave me that freedom. And I will never turn back to it because it only brings pain. Alex, any last words for people who are watching your testimony right now? I pray that you receive with an open heart because Jesus has done miracles in many people's lives in these times because we're living in dark times. We're living in times where America has taken Jesus out of it. But Jesus is coming for his children and he's coming for every single person that is willing to receive him because there is freedom in the name of Jesus. There is freedom and there is more to this life. This life here brings forth death, but Jesus gives us eternal life. Today, he's knocking on the door of your heart. Today, he's calling you by your name, not by your sin, but by your name. And he's saying, come to me all who are weary and heavy burdened because he loves you that much. He loves you more than anything or any drug could ever love you. And I'm, call I'm here to tell you 
that there is freedom in Jesus' name. He's the only one that can remove those chains from your life. Alex, for people who are watching right now and are receiving that word, uh, could you just pray for them as they yes. watch? Heavenly Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would re just receive every single person with open arms as you did with me, Lord. We know that you are a loving Father. We know that you are all-knowing, Father. You know their names. And whoever this is speaking to, Father, even even the parents of the brother, Lord, that, that brother Ryan, Father God, that you would restore their hearts, Father God, that you would heal them, Lord. And I ask that you would have your way in their lives, Lord. Every single person watching this, Father God, I ask that you would open their heart to you, Father God, that they would receive you that they would know that you are telling the truth through this testimony because it is you who is speaking. It is not me, Lord. It, it, I'm just here to be a vessel for your glory and your glory alone. I ask, Lord, that every addiction from any person that is watching this that would be broken in the name of Jesus, that it will have no power over them because there is another way and you are the other way, Father God. You are the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name, amen.